I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, buckle up. We're going somewhere. Come on, tell them we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Because right now we're getting ready. I know Pastor Kevin gave you a little example of where we've been, but we're still going somewhere. God has a purpose for today. He has an assignment today for this service for me to deliver, but he also has an assignment for you to pick up. So this morning, as we come together, part of what you're doing is you're just coming up and saying, okay, God, what, what's my assignment today? What do you have for me today? You're pulling your seat up to the table and you're saying, okay, God, I'm here to eat at your your table. What have you prepared for me today? Whatever it is, I promise it's going to be good and beneficial for you. How many of you ever had your mom make you eat your peas or your spinach or something you didn't like on your plate? I would, my mom still talks about it. I would take those peas and kind of flick them around my plate and make them do a dance, you know. And sometimes they'd go on the floor and my dog Frisky would eat them, you know. And uh, I didn't want to eat my vegetables. But how, you know, if you pull up to the table, the Lord's table, he has prepared for you just what you need. He knows what you like. He knows if you like chocolate or not. He knows your favorite flavor of ice cream. But he also knows on the inside the nutrients that you lack and where you're deficient. So anytime you come to the word, anytime you come to church, his heart, anytime you gather together, you open up your heart and you approach him and you, you purpose to spend time with him, you're pulling up to the table and he will always deliver exactly what you need. Now it's up to you if you're going to eat those peas on the plate. What am I doing right now? Right now I'm just taking a moment because I'm wanting everybody to buckle up. Have you ever been at the house and there's one person who's running out the door? Everybody else is buckled. The car's running. You're honking the horn like, we've got to go. I see some of you tapping your neighbor. That's me sometimes in our family. Running out the door with my shoes saying, I'm coming. I just don't want anybody to miss the car. Here we go. All right, everybody. We're going to start. Uh, the Lord had put on my heart. Uh, two words specifically when I was praying. Yesterday, the ladies got together. We had a wonderful time uh, just hanging out and having some coffee and praying together. And what he put on my heart was R&R. &R. You need some R&R. &R. How many of you like R&R? &R? Take a vacay and get some R&R, &R, right? Okay, good. Well, you're going to get some R&R &R with that today as you pull up to the table. But the word that he gave me was refocus and recenter. To refocus, which has to do with your vision. And to recenter, which has to do with your position. So let's look at this for just a minute because I believe that if you and I can get where God's going with this today, if we can buckle up and we can travel on this road with him, as we take our R&R, &R, our recentering and our refocusing, it will actually bring us to that place of rest and relax that we know R&R &R to be and that we naturally assign to the letter R&R. &R. So refocus, let's look at that for just a moment. Hebrews 12 to in the Passion Translation, it says, we look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and our expectation onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. So here you see we're supposed to look away from some things. So I challenge you as we're talking about refocus, the Lord may drop something into your heart um, or, you know, into your mind for a minute and say, maybe this is something you need to look away from. That may be the pea on your plate or the spinach that you don't want to eat today. But here it says, when we look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and our expectation onto Jesus he has already birthed the faith within us, and he is leading us somewhere. So here he's asking us to believe him about the assignment and the thing he speaks to your heart. And he says, I'm going to give you an assignment. I'm going to point you in a direction. I'm going to give you the faith to do this. And then I'm also going to say, walk this way. I'm going to lead you. Walk this way. Talk this way. That's Pastor Kevin in there for you. He always puts the songs in there. Okay, yes, praise God. Hallelujah. 
Walk this way. So Jesus is going to say, walk this way and talk this way. For real, he's talking to us today. And he's leading us forward into faith's perfection. And where we miss it so many times is that we focus on something else. And here it would be something in the natural realm. And then we're trying to go into faith's perfection. We're trying to enter into that. But we can never do it. Because we can't do it on our own. And God's not asking you to do it on your own. He wants to take your hand and go with you, and he wants to lead you in this direction into faith's perfection is what it says. The next part says, his example, Jesus' example. This is his example. Jesus will never ask you to do something he hasn't already done. Jesus will never ask you to go somewhere that he hasn't already been. So anytime you enter into a situation and you think, I don't know what's going on here. I've never been in this situation before. Jesus is right there with you and he says, I have. I'll lead you. Look this way. Listen, follow me. Let's go this way. So it says, his example is this. Because his heart, Jesus' heart, was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. What was he focused on? us. Jesus was focused on us, focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and he conquered its humiliation. Come on, while he was hanging up there on that cross, and we've all heard this before, but I want you to think of it. Jesus on the cross, thinking about me right now, right here in 2021, sitting in this seat. This is my latitude and longitude in life. This is my situation, my circumstance. He knew all that. And yet here it says he endured all of that for you, and he conquered the humiliation of having to do that gut-wrenchingly horrible, hard, dirty, nasty, humiliating experience of being on the cross when at any moment he could have himself said, I don't have to do this. But what kept him in the hard time, what kept him grounded, what kept him nailed to the cross is because he loves you so much. In that moment, with all of the pain, with the humiliation, with people spitting on him, pulling his beard out, nailing him to the cross. How did he make it through that? He was focused on you. And for me, when I read this scripture, I think about, so when I'm having my worst day and I feel like I'm being nailed to the wall with my situation and my circumstance, I feel like people are coming at me with every type of accusation, with pointing their fingers saying I'm wrong, or just the enemy is bombarding me with thoughts saying you're not good enough, you're not fast enough, you're not smart enough, you're not qualified enough to try and humiliate me and cause me to back down. This tells me here, if I follow his example, What will help me to endure and you to endure on your bad day is when you focus on knowing him. And here he says he was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be together. So I want to challenge you as we're doing this and we're going to refocus and we're doing that right now. As you're just letting this sit and sink into your heart, don't let it stop at your head. Let it go all the way down to your heart. Think about it. Listen, the point of today, it's not to be able to regurgitate everything that you hear. The point of today is for you to take in what God has put on your plate. There will be something said today that you miss or you're like, oh, that was good, but this really stands out to me. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit pointing something out that's specific for you right now in this season of your life that he wants you to remember. So I encourage you to write it down. Take notes on your phone. I love in the message translation, he says, do you see what this means? This is verse 2 and 3 in Hebrews chapter 12. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, these veterans cheering us on. It means that we better get on with it. Come on, if you're, if, if, if I, I've been feeling like just in, in the body of Christ, we have got to get on with some things. If you look up and you see everything that's going on in the world today, I mean, on an international scale, it's crazy. If you see everything that's going on in our own nation, it's things I never would have dreamed. We got to get on with some things. Here he says, strip down and start running. And never quit. 
No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sin. Keep your eyes, your focus on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. Come on, he's our example. He's our example today. He's our example every day. He's never going to ask you to go somewhere that he hasn't already been. He's never going to ask you to endure something that he hasn't already endured. But I promise you, he does have joy that you haven't even experienced yet, but he has it for you. That's one of the things on the plate today. Come on, as you pull up to the table, come on, we take our peas and we also take our dessert. We take it all in. Come on, I want everything that God has for me today. Here it says, study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And when you find yourself flagging in your faith, Go over to that story again, item by item. What does that mean? I'm refocusing. I'm not just going to sit down and read the word and skim through because I've read this psalm before. I've read this before. Maybe I'm going to read it in a different translation. Maybe I'm going to study it a little more and see what the commentary says about it. Maybe I'm going to go back over my notes from Sunday morning. Maybe I'm going to pull up a podcast from that message I heard that one time that I really liked, man. It like that service rocked my world. What was it about? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? I have. What does that mean? That means that's something we need to go back to. That's God saying, go back here. I've got something for you. It's something that you need. It'll help you. So he says, when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility that he's already plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. Isn't that good? I love that translation. Come on, as we go back, we take it back to Jesus. What are we doing? We're taking it back to the cross. We're refocusing on the cross. Come on, that's not just an Easter message. And if you think, well, I just don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Like, I only think it's supposed to be at Easter. And then baby Jesus in the manger at Christmas. No, no, no. That means you need to read it again. That means you need to read it in a different translation. That means you need to take the story of the cross, read through it and say, Holy Spirit, I need you to unfold this for me. I need you to unpack this for me. And I need you to show me how to apply it to my life. And then you sit down and you read the word and he will. He'll start to tell you things. And even if he does it right there in that moment, I guarantee you that later on in the day, he will start to bring things back to your remembrance at the right time. If you ever sit down to read the word and you think, I don't think I just got anything out of that. I mean, I was trying for 10 minutes, God, 10 minutes. And I don't understand any of it. At that moment, you just say, God, I trust you're going to make it clear. I'm trying. I'm putting forth the effort. I can't tell you how many times once I opened the door of my heart to Jesus, I was 20 years old, and I would hear all about this, and I thought, man, that's good. That's, I need to like find out about this is good. But sometimes I would sit down in my home, and I would start to read, and I would think, I don't understand anything. But in that moment, I would say, God, I'm trying. Work with me, God. Come on, if my kids come to me and they say, Mom, I'm trying, I'm trying to do this math homework, but it's so hard. Can can you work on this with me? Can you help me? I'm stuck. Our response should should never be when our child comes to us and says they're stuck and they need help. Our response should be, yes, I want to help you. God's response is always, yes, I'm here. I'm going to help you. Let me show you. Look here. Look at this. Don't look at that. Follow me this way. That's always his response. Come on, his response is never, I'll be there in five minutes. That's not God. Come on, when you focus a lens, I love this part, you focus a lens, it's also called ocular accommodation. I got any photographers in here? Anybody just like to take pictures? Some of you? I mean, there's binoculars in there. Yeah, Allison, she's a great photographer. She has, as she ducks down back there, she's running the media department. She's over in the media department. Thank you, Allison, for doing what you do. She is a, a great photographer and knows how to bring things into focus really well. Um, ocular accommodation, that one's for you. 
<laughs> it's the ability of the lens to alter the shape of the object and to allow it to be seen clearly. Come on, whenever you focus your lens on your camera, most people don't know what it is because we have so many auto-focus devices now. Hold your iPad up, hold your phone up, and it auto-focuses. But back in the day, some of you may still have one of those lenses that you have to turn. You know, you put it up to your eyeball. You're not screenshotting, but you take that lens. For me, I would have to take my glasses off, and I would put the little, the little window up to my eye, and I would have to do this number. Anybody remember that? Okay, if not, I got another example for you right here. I had these handy. Who knows what these are? Binoculars. These are Vortex binoculars. Uh, I don't know what that is. They're on the window. <laughs> I mean, they were on the, on the uh, um, oh, yeah, they're Kevin's. He uses them for hunting. So they were, they were sitting out. But here, what I do is I take this knob right here, and can everybody see it turning? Or you get the idea of what I'm saying. Everybody held binoculars before? This little wheel right here, it turns. So as I turn it, it is focusing on the inside. And so as I take this, I can look a far distance and I can see clearly what is going on to something that is far away. And only responsibility I have to do is just millimeters turn this little wheel. And for you and I, God is asking us to make these millimeter small adjustments in comparison to what he's trying to do. Take things that are so far out of your reach, so far out of your world, so far out of your thinking, and bring them close so that you can see clear what he's got going on and what really is happening. He's asking you to do a minuscule amount of work in us refocusing our life. And sometimes we think that, oh my gosh, I got to get up an hour earlier and I'm trying to weed the word and my kids and my dogs and I'm late for work. And we make it this giant thing like God is asking us to run a marathon to spend time with him. When he's asking us to do these minuscule millimeter turns to refocus so that he can do this extravagant thing in your life. And I, I, the one thing he put on my heart when I was thinking about this was that there are some things, and, and this device can only bring the image of the thing clearly to you if you're far away. And I, I started looking at like the Hubble telescope, and man, man I got to put my glasses on here. Focus, okay, focus. So it was so interesting. The Hubble can can look uh, ten to fifteen billion light years away, and NASA is about to come out with a, a telescope, and it's called the Webb, and it's going to be a hundred times more powerful than the Hubble. But these devices can only help you to see what is so far away and what you could never see in your own ability. But I want to challenge you because what the Lord said was, I want to take those things that are far off and bring them into your reality now. Those things that you've been reaching for and you can't grab, I'm going to bring it to you. You're not just going to see it from a distance, but you're actually going to possess it. You're going to obtain it. You're going to walk into that space. You're going to walk into that position, to that promotion, to that dream that he has been showing you and he's been unfolding that looks so far away, but it's so good, God. I can see it clear now. Now he wants to bring it now. Come on, he wants to bring it now. He, he wants to bring clarity, but there's some things for you and for I that now he's saying you can't reach it. For some of you, it may be a decade away, but if you will focus, God, bring that thing and supernaturally bring you forward a decade in your walk with him. If you will focus, come on, what can we do? It's, there's no limitations here. It's on us to do the minuscule millimeter adjustments of focusing on him, focusing on his word. Okay, let's look at, at recenter for a moment. 
This one's so important. Come on, this one has to do with your position. One has to do with your vision. So I encourage you to check out what are you looking at? What are you giving most of your time? What's coming in your eye gate? Because when it comes in your eyes, I guarantee you, your head is thinking about it. And if you think about it long enough, it drops down into your heart. And your heart is where God wants to speak to you. What are you letting take residence in your heart that is taking up room where God is supposed to be? I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, but if he just answered, I would write it down for you. Listen, I have to say these same things to myself. I'm not beyond this. While I was studying for this, there's things he's put in my heart that your vision, you need, don't look here, you need to look here. You need to focus on this again. You let go of that. Pick it back up, refocus on this. I did tell you to do that. He's so good. Okay, recenter. This has to do with your position. Matthew 6, 9, in the Passion Translation, it says, Our beloved Father dwelling in the heavenly realms, may your glory, the glory of your name, be the center on which our lives turn. Come on, the glory of his name, his name be the center on which our lives turn. If we took that one verse, man, just spoke it over our life every day. God, today, the glory of your name is the center of my life. The glory of your name is the center of my Monday. The glory of your name is the center of my Tuesday. The glory of your name is the center of my house on Pedraski Road. The glory of your name is the center of my school on this street. The glory of your name is the center of my workplace today. The glory of your name is the center of my marriage today. Come on, take all those things that are individual compartments in your life and bring the glory of his name into it and put his name in the center. Say, God, you're the center of this. Let's look at Genesis 22. This is where Abraham offers Isaac to the Lord, you know, this is a, a, a pretty tough conversation and a, a pretty tough situation. And so I want to encourage you because I, I don't think any of us have been in this situation. So this should um, help everybody and encourage everyone today. Genesis 22, and we're reading in the Amplified Bible. Come on, somebody. Lots of words. <laughs> yeah. It's not the point to memorize all the words. But the words that do stand out to you, lay hold of them today. It's for you. That's the, the Lord pinging your heart and saying, ah, ah, this, all oh, that point right there. Remember that. Genesis 22, verse 1. It says, after these events, God tested and proved Abraham and said to him, come on, Abraham's going through a test here. Many of us, we've been through tests or you're in the middle of a test right now. He tested and proved him, said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. It's Abraham's response. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham got up early. Can you imagine the thoughts that went through his head before he went to bed that night? I can't imagine. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and he took his two young men, two young of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering and then he began to tr- the trip to the place of which God had told him. Come on, God's telling him to go somewhere. This has to do with our recentering. There's a positioning here. There's a place here. Abraham's going somewhere. The Lord told him to go somewhere. Let's come down to verse 7. It says, And Isaac said to Abraham, My father, he said, Here I am, son. Isaac said, See here, there are five. There's fire and there's wood, but uh, where's the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Abraham's response. He's in a tough situation, probably excruciating, like, What is going on, God, here? I don't understand. Have you ever been in a situation and you thought, God, I don't understand what's going on here? We can all relate here. Because Isaac is saying, God, I don't understand what we're doing. Why is there no lamb? And Abraham's saying, God, I don't understand all of what God's doing either. But we're going to still trust him. Abraham said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb for the offering. 
So the two went on together. They came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took hold of the knife to slay his son. Come on, can you imagine? We're, we're getting into this right now because we're going somewhere and we're buckled in. Okay? Taking the knife, drawing the hand back. He said, don't lay a hand on the lad or do anything to hurt him. For I know that you fear and you revere God since you've not held back from me or begrudgingly or reluctantly giving me your son. Then Abraham looked up and glanced around and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and got that ram, put him up on the altar, and that was the provision for the offering. You see, God was after and wanted Abraham's attention and he wanted his heart and he wanted first place in Abraham's life. But for you and I, sometimes we get off center, we get out of focus in our life, and we take these other things that, that well-meaning, we're trying to do good, and you can even do it while you're serving the Lord. You get out of focus of being on God and centered on God, and you get centered on the plan that he's given you, you get centered on the project that he's given you, you get centered on another person that maybe he's even sent you to minister to. And then in that moment, though, because you're off center and you're off focus, you can't see or hear clearly, and you're trying to do everything in your own ability, and it won't work. So when we recenter and we refocus, and then we can see those things he's put in our path, at that moment, he's also going to provide what you need to do what he told you to do. He told Abraham to go. Make an altar, put, let's do an offering. You're going to give me an offering. And in the same time, while Abraham, with every step, is following God, probably thinking, I don't know what's going on here, son, but God said this is what I'm supposed to do, so I'm doing it. God's leading him in this direction, up this mountain, and to build this altar right here. And if Abraham would have been in any other place and not follow God, that ram would not have been there. You and I, sometimes we're trying to follow God, but yet we're not really centered and focused. And we're kind of just walking in this direction. The Lord's like, I told you to go that way because I'm a good dad. I'm a good father. And I've provided what you need to do what you're trying to do. But you're not following me. You're not centered on me and focused on me. So you're kind of veering off into another, another field. Come back. Because when Abraham followed God, even not understanding how this is going to work. Have you ever had a day and you thought, God, I don't understand how we're going to get through this. I had a lot of days like that in 2020. When the hurricane hit, I'll tell you, and, and we teach and we are grounded in the word. But there was, the enemy was trying to shake me with everything that was going on. All, nothing I caused. You understand? Nobody caused that to happen. It happened. But the enemy wanted to use it to try and shake me off. God, how are we going to get through this? How is this going to work, God? I don't even understand what's going on here. I just want to cry. I had those days. That's okay. But I kept following and trying to recenter. And every day, there was days when I'd have to recenter every single day. I got to recenter on you. I got pulled off again. I failed yesterday. Well, new day today, new grace, new mercy. I'm going to recenter today. Oh, new day today. New grace, new mercy. I'm recentering. I'm refocusing. And you see, as Abraham is following God, and when he says, build the altar, all right, let's do this thing right here, and he gets ready to do it. Then it says, if you notice, Abraham looked back and right there. If he wouldn't have been following God in this direction, there would not have been the ram right here at the place he was supposed to be. So if you and I can take from this that we get recentered back on God, that's our place where his provision is. That's our place where he's got what you need. That's our place where he is supplying everything. Life, strength, health, resources, finances, direction, ability. Come on, he's got all that. And it's not that he's not providing but sometimes we just aren't very good at being centered and focused and we end up way over there and then we blame him. God, you're not supplying any of my needs. I've been standing on your word. 
It's like, well, you, you kind of, you're kind of trying. And God will meet you there. But he's got something better for you. When we stay recentered and refocused, and man, if, when we start to do that as a church and as the body of Christ, all of us start to recenter our attention, refocus our attention. Man, we're like that Hubble telescope. We can see way out there. And those things that seem so far, and they are impossible, they come into our reality, into our existence as a church, as a body, so that we can then affect our community. Come on, I want to see Southwest Louisiana. I want to see a turn in Southwest Louisiana. Come on, I've heard so many good things about, all oh, the economy, and you can do the position of where you are, and the oil and gas, and this stuff, that's, that's great, but I want to see God here. Come on, I want to see that. I want to see that turn, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen when the body of Christ, when we can, as a whole, start to recenter and refocus on him. But that will never happen as a whole if you and I don't do it individually. If we don't do it at home on Monday morning, if between now and dinner time tonight, you get out of focus and you get off center of God, and then you go to bed out of center and off focus, you wake up out of center, off focus, it takes effort, y'all. It takes effort to recenter and refocus. When your tires get out of alignment, you take it to a professional because you can take that jack, jack up that car and try and mess with that wheel as good as you can. You may be able to help it some, some of your car people. But I can tell you, I was on the side of the road with a flat with Kevin and our kids were little in the car. And we were between here and Eunice on some road where there was nothing but fields. And I thank God that he was there because as we're doing all this, I'm thinking, I remember everything my dad told me. But I don't know if I could actually do quite all this. I mean, my dad even had me get out there and practice in the driveway. When the circumstances are all nice and when my dad's sitting right there showing me what to do and all the tools are lined out right here and he shows me how to get leverage because my biceps may not have been quite so strong, baby, you can still do this. But when you get out on that road, you get out on the battlefield and you are not recentered and you are not refocused and you're like, but I'm in the army of the Lord. Yeah, but you forgot to put on your armor. Come on, you left your sword. You left your shield. You are in the army. You do have an assignment. You do have weapons, but you left them over there. Go put your shoes on. You are barefoot. Come on. And if you notice here, God, when he had provision for Abraham, he put a ram in the thicket. And if you look at it, a ram, this, we look this up, a ram denotes great strength, anything strong, specifically a chief politically. Come on, he's even talking about with authority and politically. Come on, he's got that provision for you and I, that authority to where we can even speak into our economy, into southwest Louisiana to see a change. It says also a ram from his strength, also a strong support. Come on, he's got that provision that you need as a strong support in your life. Some of you think, I'm all alone. God's like, no, you're not. I've got support for you. Come on, let's recenter and refocus. And when you get centered and focused, you're going to see it. You're going to see my provision. God did not show up with a squirrel. There was not a squirrel with his tail tied around the thicket trying to get away. And God's like, there's your offering. There's your offering, son. I've got a squirrel for you. No, God gave a ram. And he said, there's a reason behind this. Because he showed up with strength. He showed up with something that had horns. And the part of the animal that was tied up was his horns in the thicket. So I got the strong animal. And I got him tied up with the strongest part that he has. I got something for you. So God's here today for you saying, I've got something for you. Come on over here. Refocus. Look over here. I've got what you need. And as you get recentered and refocused, then you can see clearly what he's got for you. So how do we do all this? How do you take today's message of recentering and refocusing? And maybe right now you're thinking, I, I agree with everything she said. I want to do that. How do you walk that out? What does that look like when you leave this door? All of you should have come in, and when, they, when you came in, they handed you 
they handed you um, a passage of scripture. It's Psalm 23. And I just, I want to share with you, for me, this is one way that I refocus and I recenter when I'm diligent to do it. You understand? It takes effort on my part. And this scripture here, I love it. it, it um, it's powerful. It's powerful. Let's look at it for a moment. Psalm 23 in the Amplify, we're just looking at the first five verses. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. These were David's words. And even last night, as I, I got down, because I had this out here last night, and before I knew we were going to use it, I said, God, I'm just going to, I want to read Psalm 23. And the enemy says, yeah, that's David's words. And I said, yeah, those are David's words, but man, they're good words. They're God-honoring words, and they're in the Bible. So they're my words too, God. These are my words too, and I mean it. And I hooked my heart up, and I got down right here, and I kneeled down right here, and I had that same little paper right there. I said, God, you're my shepherd. I'm your sheep. Bah. I did. I really did that. God, you're my shepherd. God, thank you. You are, you are now feeding me. You are now guiding me. And you are now shielding me. I shall not lack. God, I choose to believe your word over my feelings right now. Because I don't feel like I feel any of this. But God, you said in your word right here. And my heart's connecting with it, God. You are my shepherd. That's who you are to me. You're feeding me. I know you are. I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. I'm reading the word. And I believe that you're feeding me and you're guiding me. Give me some direction, God. And you're shielding me. Come on, you spend time like this with the Lord. And he'll shield you through things that come at you during the day. And you may never even know they came and they left. Because your shepherd is shielding you as a good shepherd does. Come on, there's a reason why he called you and I sheep. Sheep don't have horns. Sheep are meant to follow the shepherd. Sheep are gentle animals. They don't have any defensive gear on. We need that shepherd. we got to stay close to him. Next part says, he makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pasture. I'll tell the Lord, God, I'm asking you to make me lie down. You're my shepherd and I'm your sheep. And when you speak, I respond to your voice. And there may be times throughout today that I need to stop and I need to hear you. I need to stop and concentrate on you. So, God, you just make me. If there's times in my lunch break, then you just, just speak to me, God. Make me lie down. And fresh, tender, green pastures. What is that? That's nourishment for your soul. Come on, he didn't bring them where the grass was dead. No, the sheep, God brings, he's a shepherd. He brings us to the grass where it's fresh, tender, green pasture to nourish our soul. So as I'm reading this, I say, God, you nourish, you provide what my soul needs right now. My soul is satisfied in you. That's my mind. I'm, I'm going to say my mind doesn't race on everything else. Because my soul, my mind is satisfied on you. It's part of my soul. My emotions, they don't have to go haywire. Right now as I'm doing this, when it just rains, my emotions back in. I pull them back in. Because as I focus on you, there's a rest that comes. There's a peace that comes. And it says, he leads me beside still and restful waters. God, you're leading me today. Even though my day may be full, i got a full schedule, I can walk and rest. And you're leading me beside water where I can drink. And it quenches my thirst. Today, God, you quench my thirst. If I'm hungry, you feed me. When I'm thirsty, God, you quench that, fart, that thirst. Verse 3 says, he refreshes and restores my life, myself. God, you refresh me today. You restore me today. I need to be restored today. God, you lead me in paths of righteousness. Today, God, I believe you're leading me in paths of uprightness. God, you're leading me, and I am in right standing with you. Not for my earning it, 
but it's for your name's sake, God. Come on, I couldn't do anything to get this qualification. I couldn't do anything to get this right standing with God, but you've given it to me all because you love me that much. Verse 4 says, Yes, though I walk through the valley, the deep, sunless valley of the shadow of death, I choose, I insert this, because he says, I will. I choose to fear nothing. God, I make a conscious choice to not fear. And when fear tries to creep in, when the feeling of fear comes in, I remember your word, that you're refreshing, you're restoring, you're leading me in these paths. And even though it seems dark because I'm walking through a valley and it's sunless, it says I'll fear nothing because you are with me. Come on, that means on your worst day, God is there. On your worst day, he is walking with you. And if you can't feel him and you don't see it, just just got to millimeter refocus. Just got to get in position and re- get back on center. Listen, may mean you've hit a pothole. And it just threw things out of alignment because in life there are potholes. But he can recenter you in such a wonderful way when we put the effort forth like this. And then the last part says, your rod protects me and your staff guides me they comfort me God you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil surely only goodness and mercy unfailing love follow me all the days of my life well it's such a great great verse the one point one part that, that God highlighted. And for me, that's something that I do in, in the morning. And I make it personal. God, you're my shepherd. You're not just David's shepherd. You're my shepherd. This is what you're doing for me today. You're feeding me and you're guiding me. How do I know? Because your word says it. And your word is true. And I take you at your word. Sometimes I say, God, you said you would feed me today. I feel malnourished. I need you, God. I know I need you. So I know that you're going to feed me today. So then I just keep my eyes and my ears listening for his voice. God, he's a good dad, and he does provide. The one point, though, that the Lord pointed out for me and for us today was the, the last verse that I read about, verse 5. You prepare that table before me, and then he says, you anoint my head with oil. What does that mean for you and I? When you study that, it says, then... Uh, that when the head was anointed with oil, it was a sign of giving him an abundance of good things. Man, the Lord wants to anoint your head with oil. He wants to give you, and he has for every person in here, an abundance of good things. Come on, these are tailored fit good things for your situation, for your personality, for your season that you're walking in. He's got something just for you, good things, not only for necessity, but for pleasure and delight. He doesn't just want to meet your need. Come on, but when you let him anoint your head with oil, you spend time with him, you make it personal and say, God, this is who you are to me. And I believe you are anointing my head with oil. Come on, that means he's supplying an abundance of good things in your life. That means that not only what you need, but it reaches into what delights you. Come on, can you see the heart of the Father here? Can you see how good he is? It says, especially pouring out largely upon him the oil of gladness and the Spirit of God and his graces, the anointing which teaches all things and filling him with spiritual joy and comfort. And I felt like we were supposed to take a moment on this part because the Lord has that for you today. And if you feel like you're in a place in your life where you're thinking, I need that. I need that oil of joy. I need that oil of gladness. I need the anointing on my head. Come on, and when it's on the head, it runs down into every other part of your life. Come on, for some of you, for some of you, you have young people that are watching you. 
But I love the reference in the Old Testament that when they would anoint the head with oil and it would run down the body. Man, it just I got this picture of as we recenter and we refocus as parents or as leaders of other people of the next generation. And we take time to recenter, refocus like this, and we see ourselves, God, you're anointing my head with oil. Come on, that means it's going to cover every part because he does the head for it to flow down to the body and to every part. But for you who are leading young people, come on, that covering will cover you and then just cover down to the next generation. And as you make that turn to recenter and refocus on him, those young people who are following you in life, you will see that turn in their life of them getting recentered and refocused on God. And you will have to say very little because the way that you lead, the way that you recenter and refocus, they will see it. You will model it for them. Come on, can you and I imagine that as leaders of the next generation, if we'll just recenter ourselves and refocus, do you see the chain reaction that could happen here? For the body of Christ, that sleeping giant to really rise up. And come on, I said it earlier. I believe God for revival in southwest Louisiana. I believe God for a change. But if it doesn't happen in me first, it'll never happen in everybody around me. And us as a church, if it doesn't happen in us first here, we can't take it out into our community to affect our community. And that's what it's going to take. That's what we need in the time that we're living in. But specifically for today, if you would like, I would like to lay hands on you and pray for the oil of anoint, the anointing oil to be on your head and it to represent the oil of gladness, the abundance that God has for you, joy to spring up. Because some of you are trying to do this and you're recentering and you're refocusing, but you're hurting and it's hard to do, have a smile. It's hard to go forward with joy when you're hurting. But when that oil gets applied, it's just so soothing. It will cause things to function and to fit better where there used to be friction in your life that caused discouragement or hurt or pain. Come on, it could be physical pain even in your knee or a joint. Come on, the oil, of an anointing oil just being poured on your head for joy to spring forth and that oil will cause there not to be any more friction but you will move farther faster with an ease with a grace and in the ability of God so if that's you if you're here and you would like for me Pastor Kevin I'm asking you to come up I ask for us to pray for you and lay hands on you I would love to do that I ask you to come up right now just come up to the altar if you're here and, and you want that and you say that's for my life but you don't feel comfortable coming up to the front, you can stand just right where you are and we will pray for you. Thank you, Father. God, thank you. For me, I can't have enough of the oil. I'll tell you because friction tries to come every day and I need the anointing oil on my head as a leader, come on, in our household, for, for Kevin to carry that. I mean, that's, that's so, so important in our life for us to carry it together and model it then for even in our own house for our children to see it. Man, I need that. I'm so thankful. Come on, he's a good provider. He's a good God. God, you're good. So if that's you, come on now. If that's you, if you just want to stand where you are, that's okay too. Thank you, Father. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Come on, and it's not me that you're coming to, but you're approaching him. You're approaching the throne of God, and you're asking the Holy Spirit, because that's one form of the Holy Spirit is oil. And joy, come on, that's one of his strong suits because he comes with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And when he comes, he doesn't just bring one. He brings all of those things into your life. So we're going to pray together now corporately. And I'll just say, everybody, I want you to agree with us. We're going to join our faith with all of these people who are up here believing for the anointing of God upon their life. And for it to come forth and to manifest in the way that you need to see it right now. And not just to meet that need, but to go beyond. And to delight. 
Come on, how many of you want to serve the Lord and you just be delighted every day to wake up? You wake up with a smile. You just wake up, just delight. What does that look like? I don't know for you, but I bet it's good. Come on, and he's so good. He's a good father. Thank you, Father. Just say, I believe, I receive everything that you have.